Welcome to the best of Exploring Idaho. I'm Dee Sarton. In the past year, we have been privileged to travel much of Idaho's 83,000 square miles. We've climbed mountains, run rivers, and enjoyed the untouched beauty of her uncrowded expanses. And today, we get to relive the adventure in a special one-hour program, highlighting our favorite stories of the past year. And we begin in North Idaho, a sliver of land just 46 miles wide. But North Idaho packs a lot of punch into its seemingly small size. Among its features, dense forests, giant aromatic cedars, and wildflowers. The sound of cascading waterfalls punctuating the landscape in spring. The calm waters of Great Lakes and the sweet taste of wild huckleberries. <laughs> And North Idaho houses the state's oldest standing building, the Cataldo Mission near Coeur d'Alene. With all its wild open spaces, North Idaho has a history of attracting a certain brand of adventurers, the kind of independent and rugged people who have shaped the character of the panhandle. In the late 1800s, it was silver miners brought by the trainload. The discovery of the largest silver producing area in the world left North Idaho with a nickname still used today, the Silver Valley. But long before the silver and gold rushes, it was the lure of fur that first conquered North Idaho. In the first half of the 19th century, a hardy breed of mountain men lived off the land in hopes of trapping a fortune in beaver. It was an era rife with romance and legend, an era still admired and emulated today. My mother, 40 years ago, said I was born 100 years too late. So I've been a Martin man at heart all my life. And this is how I do it. Somewhere in the wilds of North Idaho, hunters stalk the hunted. That's the kind of thing you keep looking for, you know, if you can cut a fresh sign and then follow it to wherever you went to. Hit here. Here's the other toe. And then he could have probably boiled straight on through. The hope to bring down an elusive Idaho elk. Yeah, there's an old, old elk bed right there. It's, it's a good sign that they're in here, but not real recent. Look closely, though, and you'll slowly realize Dave Benson, Vern Ely, and Jim Baylargen are more than average hunters with 19th century clothing, black powder rifles, and all the historic accessories, these are modern day mountain men. They call themselves buckskinners. Their firearms range from an 18th century French long gun to a Lancaster rifle from the 1840s to an 1820s J. Henry rifle used for trade with the American Indians. All are muzzle loaders, that is rifles, capable of being loaded only from the muzzle. Loading them is a time-consuming procedure. I'm pouring a little powder. It starts with pouring a measure of black powder into the bore. That's 75 grains. This is followed by a piece of cloth called the patch. Mm-hmm. Got to wet it. The round musket ball is laid on top of the patch and forced into the mouth of the barrel. Then the whole works is hammered down the length of the rifle with a ramrod. The charge is ignited by a small amount of primer powder placed in a shallow cup called the pan. Yeah, it's ready to go. The whole thing is lit off by sparks when the flint strikes against metal. The resulting shot sounds somewhat like a small cannon going off next to your ear. But these men will attest, once they tried muzzle loader guns, they never went back. You Get a little black powder in your nose, you can't leave them alone after that. And not only that, but uh, black powder is more than just just the shooting. There's the, your skins, you know, your costume, and all the other activities that go with it mm -hmm. that we do that just makes it more fun, mm -hmm. more things to do besides just go out and shoot something. Mm -hmm.
In Idaho, a special hunting season is designated specifically for muzzle loaders, and guided hunts are available. North Idaho has its own version of the Great Lakes. Coeur d'Alene, Pend d'Oreille, and Priest Lake sprawl across the Panhandle as some of the largest lakes in the Northwest. Exploring Idaho's Jennifer Eisenhart reports from Coeur d'Alene. They are the sparkling gems of North Idaho, no matter how you look at them. But take a scenic flight over them and you'll gain new appreciation. Okay, we'll just go ahead right through here. Brooks Seaplane Service has become a fixture on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Since 1936, the family-owned business has shuttled passengers above the pine-forested hillsides, beyond the reach of rolling mountains, and into the endless blue sky over these wide-reaching waters. It gives a real grasp of, of how big the lakes are, how big, how much space uh, that we're lucky enough to have in northern Idaho. Colorado businessman Scott Faskin is visiting Coeur d'Alene and wants to take in the surrounding scenery. You can see so much more in a quick amount of time. Uh, you can get up and uh, uh, there's quite a lot of freedom. And if you see something over there, you just turn to the right or left and you can reach it real quickly and easily. Up here, the time goes by quickly. As we turn and position for landing, the sun glitters off the water below, as if in a final sparkling goodbye. Our brief aerial view of this great northern water is over. Jennifer Eisenhart reporting for Exploring Idaho. Lake Coeur d'Alene is fed by the placid waters of the St. Joe River. Once a working river, the St. Joe carried millions of cut logs from the mountains to mills waiting downstream. No longer used by the timber companies, the St. Joe has retired to quietly inspire fishermen and boaters. And fall is an exceptional time to visit the St. Joe, when bright autumn colors reflect off the clear, clean water. You might call Richard Smart of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, the father of rail biking. Or you might just call him crazy. Okay, this is a nice section here. Whatever you call him, you'll find him most afternoons riding his modified mountain bike on one of North Idaho's train tracks. It's pretty simple, but it used to be real complicated, but 20 years of developing, you know, it gets easier. Richard is the proud maker of the rail cycle. Even his friends will tell you it's a handy invention. I'm working on my own cycle right now. I love it. Basically, a rail cycle is a regular mountain bike, retrofitted with an outrigger and other gadgets that allow a two-wheeled bicycle to balance on a two-inch rail. Okay, this is the guide wheel, and the guide wheel is primarily what keeps you on. It rides on the inside of the track just like the flange on a, on a train. For some people, it's pretty hard to understand why anyone would pit a bicycle against a train. Richard Smart has one smart bit of advice about that. You don't ever ride on active track. As Richard says, just one train can ruin your whole day. So he's pretty particular about using only abandoned tracks. Today, Richard takes his friend Drew Meyer on a favorite ride, this stretch of rail along the Coeur d'Alene River. It's really fun. I canoe and backpack and hike and I like this the best because it's, it's more of an adventure. You don't have to look where you're going. If it's a clean section of rail, then you can just ride the bike will do all the work and you can look all around and it's silent. And for those of you who still think he's crazy, Richard Smart offers another bit of advice. Give rail biking a try. You may just find yourself hooked on this simple, silent, and scenic sport. I've never got tired of it. I get as excited right now as I did 20 years ago. To ride along in total peace and cover a lot of miles and see beautiful scenery. What an interesting man. Well, the best of Exploring Idaho will be right back. Coming up, history almost takes a terrible turn in north central Idaho. Plus, the roughest mail route in the country cuts right through the heart of Hell's Canyon. Those stories and more when the Best of Exploring Idaho returns. A 
Of all the states in the Union, only Alaska has more than Idaho's 18 million wild acres. Many of those acres are found in north central Idaho. In the rough shape of a square, north central Idaho boasts great variety. From the snow-capped peaks of the Seven Devils to America's deepest gorge, Hell's Canyon, from the rolling wheat fields of the Palouse to the dense green of bitterroot forests, North Central Idaho invites exploration. But the first white explorers to Idaho found this land to be difficult and disagreeable. Back in 1805, the rugged bitterroots of North Central Idaho almost ended the famous expedition of Lewis and Clark. We proceeded onto the top of the dividing ridge from which I discovered immense ranges of high mountains still to the west of us, with their tops partially covered with snow. Captain Meriwether Lewis. The jagged, snow-topped peaks were a sobering discovery. But with horses they bought from the Shoshones near present Salmon, Idaho, and a native guide to lead the way, the expedition moved into the mountains on a crisp September morning in 1805. They were now almost two years into this expedition, and this was the place above all others in which they came the closest to having to turn back or dying. Mm -hmm. And actually, they would have died before they would have turned back. Hungry and tired, the men hiked through an absolute maze of deadwood. Their pack horses often stumbled and fell without food and famished from exertion. At one point, the men resorted to eating their young colts just to survive. But the expedition carried a large quantity of vital supplies, and to carry those supplies, they needed their horses. So something had to be done, and quickly, to prevent total starvation. Six days into the journey, and only halfway through the mountains, the expedition was at the breaking point. September 16th, 13 miles over the mountain passing. Immense, difficult knobs, stony, much falling timber, and immensely steep, with great difficulty, we proceeded on. I have been wet and as cold in every part as I ever was in my life. Captain William Clark. Extreme fatigue and hunger were tearing the expedition apart. The situation was critical. They took a very desperate step. They split up, and Clark, with a small party, went ahead to get down out of these mountains and find some Indians who could help. Mm -hmm. And they did, the Nez Perce. And they sent back fish and roots to the main party, which was coming on behind them. And they just did make it, just barely. Finally, the bitter roots were behind them, but their ordeal was far from over. Immediately after the mountain passing, the men went to work building a series of dugout canoes. This video shows a group of Idahoans recently recreating that labor-filled task. After hollowing out five trees by hand, the original expedition set off down the Clearwater River, then down the Snake, the Columbia, and all the way to the Pacific Ocean in those precarious dugout canoes. The Hell's Canyon mailboat departs every Wednesday morning. Every week. Every Wednesday. Rain or shine or sleet or hail. High water, low water, we go up. From this dock on the Snake River near Lewiston, Idaho. You guys ready for the tour? We are ready. We are ready. We are ready. This week, a group of 10 guests will ride comfortably on the 40-foot passenger jet boat that delivers Hell's Canyon mail. Here's where we're headed, 100 miles into the deepest river canyon in North America. So with the guests on board and the mail bag safely stowed in the bow, the boat departs for a two-day river adventure. Well, it's a place of a really awesome, raw beauty. I would say it's raw beauty because it's not man-made. Very little, very little of man's desecration of nature shows. In one place, we touch shore and walk just a short distance up a trail to peer directly into the lives of those early humans with the help of some clues they thoughtfully left behind. That's a little kid's swing for sure. Look at how mossy and rotten the seed is now. 
Can you imagine somebody cranking out a living here? But while these old homesteads rot away, plenty new homes upriver wait for the mail. The same 32 cent stamp that delivers a piece of regular mail brings these letters into Hell's Canyon. Mailboxes perch precariously along the riverbank, waiting for that one special day of the week. The delivery brings letters, magazines, and news of the day. The address, by the way, is simply Snake River Route, Lewiston, Idaho. It seems to be probably about half advertising and half letters. That's right, junk mail. Just goes to show you're not safe no matter where you hide. After the long day of sightseeing and mail delivery, the boat pulls into a dock at Copper Creek Lodge. Surrounded by trees and softened by the soothing sound of the river, it's a setting that relaxes body and mind. This place, I think, is misnamed. They call this Hell's Canyon, but this is a, not a little bit, but this is a lot of bit of heaven, I think. <laughs> Jennifer Eisenhart reporting for Exploring Idaho. What a great opportunity. And later in the show, we'll give you the number for our Exploring Idaho field notes. Those field notes will give you all the information you need to book a mailboat trip of your own. Southwest Idaho's dramatic montage of desert, rivers, and mountains has lured visitors for centuries. First inhabited by six different native tribes, Southwest Idaho is now home to the largest metropolitan area in the state. Long and rectangular, Southwest Idaho holds within its borders a great variety of landscapes. Sagebrush deserts give way to a river oasis, famous for world-class whitewater. There are towering pine forests and inspiring canyons where raptors soar. The bounty of southwest Idaho is endlessly diverse. And so are the people. One family we profiled this year on Exploring Idaho is keeping alive a fast-paced tradition of the Wild West. The Johnson family of Caldwell holds firmly on the reins of team roping. How about Barry Johnson of Caldwell, Idaho? The pressure is big for Barry and his partner. Team roping is a favorite of the rodeo events, and on his home turf, Barry wants to win. Well, it went pretty good. We uh, didn't make as good a run as we could. We had a steer that was just decent, and uh, we just went and caught him. But there's a lot more behind a good run than just running and roping. A good run takes a good horse. A good horse takes hours of training. And good trainers, some of the most reputable around, can be found right here on the Johnson Family Ranch in Caldwell. Hey. The Johnsons train and sell dozens of winning roping horses. Father and son work together as partners in business. And partners in the ring. When he gets his horse settled in the corner, this rope right here goes back to the top of the chute. And when I pull it, it opens the gate. The hitter, he gets the, the rope on the steer's horns as soon as possible. After he ropes, he, I want to come into the hip of the steer and throw my loop. That helps to be roped with somebody that you've roped with for a while. You learn what each other's going to do. There you go. My dad taught me how to rope. And if he wants to, I'll help him learn how to rope. Good shot. Good shots seem to run in the family. From grandfather to father to son, oh, and daughter too, 10-year-old Cassie Johnson runs the ring with the rest of them. So it seems the Johnson family team has found a winning combination for roping success. Yeah, it's a team thing. Oh yeah, you get a good rush of it. They're incredible, and the Johnson's team roping horses are some of the most winning horses in Idaho. With all the gadgets available for mountain bikes these days, 
It's no wonder what they've invented now. These are aluminum studs here. Todd Olson of Screaming Toad Cycles says bike studs work just like car studs. The metal tips dig into snow and ice, which eliminates problems with traction. They also wipe out all those winter excuses for the fat tire around the belly. There's no reason to stop your training or stop having fun on mountain bikes. It's only limited to your own creativity. Looks like we're all set. Let's go ride. On a picture-perfect day at Bogus Basin, Todd cons his friend, Tom Hadzor, onto one of the snow-studded contraptions. Never done it before. This was the first time for me. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. Let's go snow riding. Yeehaw. Yeah, the experience of being up here on a, on a beautiful day like this and being able to ride your mountain bike in the snow uh, is exhilarating, to say the least. Beautiful day out of here. Beautiful day. Beautiful day for a bike ride. Jennifer Eisenhart for Exploring Idaho. Now those are some hardy souls. But you know, winter fun in Idaho includes the more traditional activities too, but always with an Idaho flair. Near the town of McCall, cross-country skiing combines with gourmet cooking for a trip to remember. Blue Moon Outfitters offers a special gourmet yurt trip. The Outfitters escort guests through snow-laden trees in Ponderosa Park, right past the sparkling Payette Lake, and into a warm backcountry yurt. Once inside, the Outfitters serve up a five-star gourmet meal, complete with wine and dessert. It's an evening that inspires all of your senses. The only hard part is skiing back out with a belly full of good food. Now fall in southwest Idaho means color. Boise is known as the city of trees and the turning leaves put on a dazzling show. But the season is loved for other reasons as well. Lingering, sunny days, great fishing. And on certain orchards in the Treasure Valley, fall is the season of bounty. Every fall, Pleasant View Orchard, and others like it, open rows of trees to the public. For one short month, all the regular varieties, bright red roams, crisp Jonathans, sweet red delicious, and others are ripe for the picking. For families or groups of friends, wandering through an apple orchard on a sunny afternoon with a wooden apple basket on your arm is a timeless getaway. Oh, it's beautiful. That's why I picked today. And yesterday I was too busy with things and... We so decided today. to take out and go yeah. and get some apples. Right. We got done with our get lunch. Our winter and apples. I said, let's leave the dishes and go get yep. apples. <laughs> That's more fun. Sure. <laughs> this is nothing new to experienced apple pickers like Helen Gussick and Olga Oberg. The two grew up picking their own apples. But still, every year the friends look forward to harvest time when they can get out and hunt for the big ones. Here's one. The crisp ones. <coughs> that's a good one. See if that's a good one. The best ones. Oh, that's a real dandy. Oh, I've always liked apples. Oh. My dad always saw that we had apples. <laughs> that's a lot of fun. The apple harvest runs from late September to late October, but the big crisp apples seem to go first. So if you plan a you pick trip, plan it for early in the season. Exploring Idaho, we'll be right back. When Oregon Trail pioneers first crossed South Central Idaho, the ground was a sagebrush desert. Today, it houses some of the richest farmland in the country. Irrigation has transformed South Central Idaho into an agricultural paradise, earning its nickname, the Magic Valley. Idaho's famous potatoes are grown here, along with dozens of other crops. And South Central Idaho is an obvious choice for tourists, for obvious reasons. Rock monoliths reach 60 stories tall and attract climbers from across the country. And history unfolds at ancient fossil beds and along the Oregon Trail. 
What may be the most popular attraction in South Central Idaho celebrated a banner year. Shoshone Falls on the Snake River boomed with record flows. Exploring Idaho's Jennifer Eisenhart brings us the story. Do you've no doubt heard about the awesome power of Shoshone Falls. It is the tallest waterfall in North America. Taller, in fact, than the famous Niagara Falls of New York. But this year, Shoshone Falls has even outdone itself. The raw power of Shoshone Falls on the Snake River is a sight and sound to behold this spring. Its massive waters impress even locals who have visited the attraction for years. Awesome, that's all I can think of. Grandchildren say awesome for everything and this is what they should see. Awesome indeed, and not yet at its fullest. Still in the early part of spring, the 212-foot Niagara of the West is headed for an all-time record. Last year was our largest water year, I think in the last 13 years. Right now we have as much, if not more, than we had last year during peak runoff in June. With a full month to go before it hits its peak, about 180,000 gallons spill over the edge every second. Well, the force of the water always just scares me. Watching the water boil to a misty bottom, she can't help but wonder if anyone was ever so unfortunate as to pass over the edge. But almost 70 years ago, an adventurous lumberjack by the name of Al Fawcett would. At 5 o'clock in the evening, Fawcett slid himself into his craft, zipped the canvas hatch, and was pushed into the current. Fawcett picked up speed, then plunged over the drop. A crowd of 5,000 spectators watched speechless as he fell. When his craft resurfaced in the mist at the bottom, out popped Fawcett with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. His only injury was a broken hand. But if Al Fawcett had seen Shoshone Falls at its peak this spring, he may have reconsidered his daring deed. Spectacular. This is wonderful. It's the most beautiful it's ever been. At Shoshone Falls, Jennifer Eisenhart for Exploring Idaho. Art in Progress describes well the detailed work of Gary Stone. I may keep this going for years and years and years, and uh, maybe we'll add just a a brush stroke or two per year. But I think it would be a good idea as long as I'm alive. <laughs> Keep adding to it, and why not? Stand back and you'll see why. This is a 70 foot wide, 20 foot tall wooden mural. In 18 colorful panels, the mural covers the entire Magic Valley and chronicles the history of Idaho transportation. From Twin Falls' first airplane, to Oregon Trail wagon trains, to Native American teepees, the mural covers it all. It's covered about it all, it just needs more cowboys. <laughs> but Gary Stone has enough work on his hands. You see, he plans not only to paint the entire Magic Valley and the history of transportation, but carefully carve them into wood, too. The wooden part, and I carved that out with the sandblaster, which that's the texturing you see. And then I take real thick paint with a palette knife and build that up where the water and everything sort of is raised. And then I paint over the top of that so it gives it a real three-dimensional effect. Now, if we could stop here and say Gary Stone's project is a painted and carved wooden mural showing the entire Magic Valley and the history of Idaho transportation, this whole project would seem reasonable. Here's my little self-portrait, this handsome guy. It's either May or Tom Selleck, I'm not sure who that is, but that's uh, who it is. <laughs> Intermixed with carvings of the Magic Valley and in between the paintings of early vehicles are hidden pictures. Large rocks hold snarling bears. The Snake River Canyon hides the brave faces of Native Americans. And if you know Braille, the colorful leaves of the Sun Valley Aspen spell out the name of a blind Twin Falls attorney. So yeah, I'm going to pay tribute to everyone that deserves it. Every brushstroke's fun right now. <laughs>
And Gary Stone is still painting on that mural. He says it won't be finished for as long as it's fun. And that could be a long time. An exciting new attraction brings outer space to Idaho. The Falconer Planetarium near Twin Falls features a state-of-the-art computer that simulates solar systems, star fields, spinning planets, and much more. Exploring Idaho's Jennifer Eisenhart joins a group of third graders as they search through the stars. Good morning, class. Good morning, Mrs. Boyan. From a small classroom in the little town of Shoshone, these third graders are tackling a big subject. We spent about six weeks, seven weeks, studying the solar system and how it fits into the universe. It's a hands-on project where the mystery of moonlight is unraveled with flashlights and reflective pie pans. Paper plates and pencils show how it's the Earth that rotates, not the sun, and a simple piece of string attached to a small styrofoam ball explains a theory of planetary orbit. And then Mercury, it's really close, so it will go really fast and stuff. Simple projects that help explain some pretty complex subjects. But the best lessons come from experience. So today, teacher Kathy Boyan will do something quite extraordinary. She's taking her entire class on a field trip to outer space. Oh, it just makes it come alive. Luckily for the kids, outer space is only about a half hour's drive from Shoshone. And I'd like to thank you for coming to see us today at the Faulkner Planetarium and the Herod Center for Arts and Science. The Faulkner Planetarium in Twin Falls opened late last year. Ever since, its programs have put Idaho school children among the stars. Like a movie theater, but better. Reclining seats comfort the virtual astronauts as they prepare to blast off on a 45-minute simulated space odyssey that leaves every textbook in the dust. Get your goggles, Elmo. Looks like another job for... The Planet Patrol. Technology can just really make things so much more dynamic and um, very visual for the children. Photographs this from the Jupiter, Hubble telescope the fly out of space onto the, the planetarium system. dome. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. I think they were enthralled. I think they were in awe of, of, of the technology, of, of the whole presentation. It looked like just like there was no roof on the, on the walls and stuff. And it looked like we were just going through space. Just one small field trip for a third grade class, but one giant leap for education. It was cool. Jennifer Eisenhart for Exploring Idaho. The planetarium features adult programs as well on astronomy, space science, and other science subjects. out and touch history in southeastern Idaho where Native Americans hold tradition high and pioneer wagons cut deep ruts along the Oregon Trail. The southeastern region occupies an entire corner of Idaho. Within its borders you'll find history, wildlife, and wild beauty. In Soda Springs a geyser shoots over 100 feet into the air. Underground near Bear Lake Minnetonka Cave impresses visitors with its eerie beauty. Oh, I think you just got there it. Are, there are. Try your hand at ice fishing for Cisco. Or drive scenic motorways through farm fields and rustic ranches. For travelers with an interest in history, southeastern Idaho is an unforgettable experience. Before the appearance of white men, the Shoshone and Bannock tribes dominated southeastern Idaho. Today, the two tribes share a reservation near Pocatello, and although they have lost much of the land they once roamed, the Shoban tribes have held on fiercely to the traditions of their ancestors. On the Shoshone Bannock Reservation near Pocatello, Native American tradition displays brightly. Tribes from across the Northwest share crafts, knowledge, and skills in a celebration of culture. We have to educate the public and 
uh, you know, you could learn about Rome, but until you get there, you won't really be so enthused about reading it from black and white in a book. You have to be there, you have to be at the scene and, and feel how the Romans felt when they were there in order to really get the, the true sense of feeling. Here, the true sense of native dance can be felt in a pounding rhythm. High-pitched song drives the footsteps of colorful dances. And soon, even the watcher feels the power of the powwow. There are stories just about everything about the dance. Uh, the buffalo hunt dance, uh, the sun dance. I mean, this is, it, everything about life is, is related to the dance. Uh, and, and the music is the same way. The powwow is centuries old. At the end of the summer season, a tribe would invite neighboring tribes to a festival of food, song, and dance. Together, they would celebrate the bounty of nature. And still today, costumes are marked by intricate beadwork, feathers, and brightly colored decorations. Spun together with the movement of dance, it's a dizzying display of pride. That incredible show band celebration takes place every fall on the reservation near Pocatello. <laughs> It's a lost art. A lot of our uh, arts are becoming lost. My grandmother said that uh, it's really important that you learn these arts before they die down. Once they're dead and gone and forgotten, then you can't bring them back. In a grassy backyard under the tall shade trees, Ramon Murillo preserves the art of his ancestors. Everything lies in traditional balance, a balance that Ramon carries on today. This particular one's elk hide here. Ramon first learned from his cousin how to take raw natural materials. See if this is the right size for the frame. And craft them into a finished drum. With elk hides and wooden frames, Ramon has mastered the craft that was once almost lost. I don't use any chemicals. Um, everything is natural. Even the paints used to decorate the drums come right out of the ground. This particular color we use in our ceremonies and in our dancing. Ramon starts by scraping the hide. His metal draw knife may be modern, but the technique is generations old. You have to hold on to your traditional knowledge, your language, uh, your arts. With the hide scraped clean, Ramon punches it with holes. Later, rawhide laces will string the hide tight around the frame. Now Ramon uses sticks to wring out moisture. While he works, he remembers all the parts of nature that come together in this drum. I have to make prayers for all of the elements from the earth that I've borrowed from the Mother Earth. I have to make prayers. Practiced hands stretch the hide across the frame. And Ramon explains that part of the reward of mastering this art lies in passing it on to others. It's really important that I help our, our young Shoshone Bannock people uh, keep our arts going and keep their education go, going. From scraping the hides to tying up the final laces. I'll just snap these two after it dries a bit and just let it dry. Because within the rhythm of these native hand drums, lies the heartbeat of a tribe's heritage. For me to have that in place uh, makes me feel really good. And this is the great part. Ramon is passing on his talent to the next generation in classes on the traditional arts. In the past year, we have visited many of Idaho's wild places, and one of our favorite spots was the Bear Lake National Wildlife Refuge near Montpelier. The Wildlife Refuge is not the biggest in Idaho, nor the best for any one particular reason, but the refuge contains within its borders dozens of species of birds. And because it's open to visitors, the refuge is a place where wildlife and people can share in the beauty of nature. 
The busiest time of year at the Wildlife Refuge is, of course, spring, when numerous varieties of birds are nesting. Exploring Idaho, we'll be right back. Jagged mountains, rushing rivers, and thundering waterfalls, eastern Idaho boasts them all. Uncrowded and uncompromised, it's a land that beckons to visitors of every kind. In the far corner of the state, eastern Idaho falls under the shadow of the towering Teton Mountains. It was this western side of the Tetons that framed the view of early mountain men gathering for their yearly rendezvous. Today, free-running rivers attract anglers from around the world, and protected areas house large numbers of wild animals and birds. One of eastern Idaho's most popular wildlife refuges doubles as a cross-country ski park in winter. Well-groomed trails bend quietly through Harriman State Park. On top of the six-foot deep snowpacks, skiers find history, scenery, and wildlife. It's one of my favorite places in the world just to come and just unwind and enjoy, enjoy the outdoors. I've skied on some other trail systems and uh, I'd rate uh, Harriman at least as good as, as any that I've ever skied on. It's a very nice uh, trail to, to start with beginners or accomplished skiers, and there's a lot of wildlife as some, as some of the other patrollers and rangers have indicated, but there's also a variety of terrain. In many places, the ease of terrain makes this a popular place for families. And just when little fingers feel the bite of winter. There are several warming huts along the eight different loop trails through the park, so next time you visit Harriman in winter, Bring your skis and your curiosity. You're in for a day of discovery. It's gorgeous, but the best part about cross-country skiing at Harriman State Park, it's absolutely free. Snowmobiles, and large groups of them. More and more folks are suiting up and finding Island Park's quiet season the right season for winter excitement. This is a winter wonderland as far as snow machining goes. You can go anywhere. And Island Park Mayor Sherry Owens should know. She's just one of the locals who enjoys 550 miles of groomed snowmobile trails one of the largest trail systems in the state. And when the snow is really good, you don't have to stay on the trails. If you're an experienced snow machiner, get off the trails and have fun. And the snow is almost always good. Today, about six feet covers the area. Groups of snowmobilers come and go like commuters on their way to work. Only these folks are onto something much better. Groves of aspen line the trail. Frosted pine trees fill every view scenic attractions lure snowmobilers even further into the woods. The excellent trails and scenery are bringing more and more people to Island Park each winter. Visitors come from as far away as Europe, and recently Island Park hosted a national snowmobiling conference. There's so many things to see. I would say you'd have to have a, a four or five days to see all there is in Island Park because of her vast trail system. So the next time you feel the need for speed, scenery, and seclusion, mark your calendar for a trip to Island Park. Once you've been here and done it, you'll be back, guaranteed. <laughs> you will be back. Now that's an invigorating way to see the countryside. And because of the excellent trail system and the deep snow, Island Park is attracting snowmobilers from all over the country. For all its wild scenery, eastern Idaho is also well-remembered for a man-made disaster. 
This year on Exploring Idaho, we revisited the site of the failed Teton Dam. Today, it appears as a harmless pile of dirt, but more than 20 years ago, the failure of the Teton Dam ripped a deadly path through the communities of eastern Idaho. Carolyn Holly has more. The event took the entire valley by surprise. 80 billion gallons of water rushed out of Teton Reservoir with unbridled destructive force. The rampaging water crashed against the river channels, then rushed across the fertile Upper Snake River Valley toward the small farming communities of Sugar City and Rexburg. I lived in Sugar City, and uh, I was, of course, at my home, and a scout came over to and told me that uh, that the dam had broke and I was supposed to leave immediately and a boy scout and uh, leave immediately and go out to high ground. Residents like Bonnie Curtis had little time. Families rushed to their cars in bedroom slippers or barefoot. They carried nothing more than the clothes that they were wearing. After Rexburg, it hit Roberts, leaving little behind. Next in line was Idaho Falls. Residents there prepared for the worst. A citywide sandbagging effort dragged through the night. On Sunday morning, the flood hit, but its force had weakened. Downriver, American Falls Dam operators frantically released water. Spillways were wide open, and still, engineers worried whether the century old dam could withstand the force of the flood. On Tuesday, the flood waters hit American Falls, and the dam held. Three days after the Teton Dam collapsed, its destructive force had finally been tamed. This is our, a piece of Idaho history, and the children need to know that this was a great thing that happened to change the lives of Grandpa and Grandma. Carolyn Holly reporting for Exploring Idaho. That was certainly a sad episode in Idaho's history, but today the Teton River remains undammed and offers some of the best fishing in eastern Idaho. Well, that's it for this year's edition of the Best of Exploring Idaho. Now we go back to work building another year of adventures. So be sure to join us for the next edition of Exploring Idaho. Good night.